Thanks for joining us in the Covenant living room. You are family, you are welcomed, and you are loved. Get ready for a life-transforming word. Why don't we give the Lord a big old clap? That was very kind, but why don't we give the Lord a big old clap? Come on, give him a big, 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 big clap. How many of you are just happy to be alive in 2024? Hello, you made it. That's a miracle and a half for some of you. Come on. You didn't think you'd be here, and you are. Uh, what a privilege it is. My wife and I, who's not here with me tonight, she's home mothering my our daughter. But um, considered a great honor and a great joy when we started dating. Uh, we started dating, I think, Gregory and Jackie, we dated what? Our first date was seven years ago. It was filled with a lot of touching, though. It was weird. Our first date, you kept hugging us. And we fell in love with your pastors, and things got pretty heavy. You started moving pretty fast. I think we already moved in without a ring on the finger. And it, we weren't sharing beds, but we were sharing hearts. And it's amazing when you get around people that are dreamers and people that think big in small places and people that are willing to fight so somebody else can have a great life. And been able to travel to 52 countries all over this world and been in some of the best churches and some of the best businesses from speaking for Mark Zuckerberg a couple of weeks ago to being here tonight in the middle of Douglas, Georgia. And one thing I can say on, with absolute honor, and you, I hope you consider it a great privilege, when you have people that are willing to stay up and fight with you for your, you know, your breakthroughs, your healings, your own personal growth, and they're there to celebrate your greatest achievements. They're there when your babies are born. They're, bare, they're there when your greatest successes happen. That's pretty amazing to have people like that in your corner. And I was talking to UFC fighter the other day, and he was saying to you just about the power of having somebody that's a corner man in your life. And in between rounds, you can go in there and get strategy so you can get back in the ring and you can make accurate shots and win. Isn't it great to have pastors like that? Can we give it up for your pastors? Come on. Who live the Jesus style, who don't preach the Jesus style. They live the Jesus style. Come on. Can you give it up for my friends? Our pastors, come on, Gregory and Jackie Pope, give them a big clap and feel the honor for a minute. Feel that. Let people love you. To God be the glory, but God gave you the ability to love people that way, and you guys do it. I want to give credit where that's due. And I don't know about you, Allison and Jeff Bramlett, come on. I don't know if I found a better preacher than Allison Bramlett. By the way, she wrote a great book, Don't Take It Personally. And how many think of, whose birthday is it, by the way? Anybody have a birthday tonight? Anybody, anybody close to a birthday tonight? Anyone have a birthday next week? Oh, somebody in the cheap seats. I see you back there. Awesome. Okay. In a minute, you could come get this. It'll be my gift to you. She wrote a really powerful book about real life knocks the hell out of you. I don't know about you. I like the idea. Your mind can make a heaven out of hell or a hell out of heaven. And so I like the idea of knocking the hell out and putting the heaven in. But I love your ability to care for people, to serve people, to improve people, and make people better. Can we give it up for Allison and Jeff? You in the cheap seats. Run down like you're the price is right. Run down. This is your moment. Give her a clap. Look at she's running. She came to claim her prize. You're awesome. And you got a great, great smile. You're about to have the best summer of your life. Watch how cool, watch it happens. Just, I'm going to go back to my speaking in a minute. But in the month of June, you're going to have an incredible door of opportunity that's going to open. And you're going to be able to take a great vacation in the summer. God's going to open up something really special for you and your family. It's going to be very rejuvenating for your life. And he's going to restore some things that you really wanted to happen actually about 2018, 17. He's going to make some things up to you. And you're going to feel like, oh my gosh, I'm back in the place that I always wanted to be. I'm not the discount version of myself. I can reclaim the life I was meant to live. You're about to get into a great place. You're going to feel health all through your thyroid is being healed tonight. And watch this, even, even the soft tissue in your knees and your hip, you're being touched tonight all throughout your body. It's bonus night for you. you got miracles in motion tonight for you. Isn't that cool? And watch how good your sleep becomes. Isn't that awesome? You came to church. you got better health care than Joe Biden gives sure that's working out too well. Smile even if you're a Democrat. Come on. You got to smile even if you're a Republican these days. They all suck. Thank God you serve a king, not a government, huh? 
Um, he's got a great track record, by the way. I do want to honor uh, so many people real quick. Let me do a couple quick commercials, and we'll jump right into this. I want to honor my best friend, Matt. I'm not going to try to re just redo that. How many know Matt's just a gift to people? Everywhere we go, Matt. Have so much appreciation for the way he shows up for people. People are better because of you. I love you. Uh, Kyle Oscopy, where are you? Kyle. I had to do that. You know what I love about Kyle? Kyle is one of the most well-connected people that I've ever met in the world, and I know a lot of people. And one thing about Kyle is he has such a keenness of not just brilliance inside of him and wisdom that unlocks so many solutions to so many problems, but he has a heart to serve people and a heart to touch God, and he wants people to experience the heartbeat of God. I love Kyle. He's traveled with me different places and businesses and corporations, and people always go, hey, where's your friend Kyle? Where's your friend Kyle? They don't ask where Matt is. They ask where Kyle's at. I think they want his wisdom. They like, they like my inspiration, but they love your wisdom. And I love the fact that you came tonight, you just showed up for a friend that was on suicide watch and a lot of trouble, and you went and flew yourself down to Florida, but you wanted to be here tonight. Can you give Kyle a big old clap for my friend? All right. And I do want to honor Jeremiah and Michelle Tasco. Stand up, you powerful people. Give them a big old clap. You're going to be hearing from these powerhouses. Oh, my gosh. The unending just successes in you guys is incredible. And Caitlin and Russ, man, you guys, I love you guys. Caitlin and Russ, you guys are cool parents, you're cool people, but you serve people. There's such a great gift and ministry gift on your life. I really honor it. You guys are really great people. And Hunter and Kelly, you guys are incredible. Give them a big old clap. I'm done with my commercials. All right, if you have your Bible, go with me to the right-hand side, Luke chapter 6. I'm going to read Dr. Luke's report, Luke chapter 6, verses 6 through 10. If you could put it up behind me, if you can, and then I'm going to do something I normally don't do in a little bit. I'm going to have to place something behind me, and it might look, actually, i going to do this one other, one other thing here before I, I read this. How many have read Love Works? We're at the Love Conference. How many have read this? How many have not? Raise your hand. How many would like me to give this to you? Raise your hand. I won't do that because you appreciate what you pay for. No, just kidding. Uh, I will give this to somebody. Uh, Gregory and Jackie wrote a book, Love Works, back a couple years ago. This is what the conference stemmed out of because they were able to offer so much insight. 21 days to take back your life, and it's really simplistic, but it's powerful nuggets to be able to transform things that are mundane into things that are miraculous. Who would want me to give you this book? I like you, sir, with the cool goatee. Okay, I'm going to chuck it all the way. Seven rows back. Let's see. Oh, he saved it. Good catch. Give him a big old clap. Let's rock and roll. All right. You ready to go? Luke chapter 6. You're not going to like tonight. You're going to love tonight. Here we go. And it goes a little something like this. It came to pass on another Sabbath that Jesus entered. Someone say entered. The synagogue or the church and he began to talk. He was there, and there was a man whose right hand was withered. To be withered, according to the dictionary, means to lose power, to lose feeling, to lose function, to dry up. He had lost his strength. It was in a withered state, verse 7. The scribes and the Pharisees watched Jesus to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath day, that they might find an accusation or an infraction against him. But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to the man which had the withered hand, I want you to stand up, and then I want you to step forward in the midst. And the man arose, and he stood forth. Then Jesus said to him, I'm going to ask you one thing. Is it lawful or permissible on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save and heal life or to destroy it? And he looked around upon them all, Mark's Verse th uh, Mark chapter 3 says he looked around them, being frustrated by them. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. Someone say, stretch out. Say it like you got juice. Someone say, stretch out your hand. And as he did so, his hand was restored as whole as the other. And they were filled with madness, it says. 
and they talked to one another about how they might destroy Jesus. Tonight's going to be through the roof. Come on, this is going to be really, really good. It's interesting that Jesus, I think, had an idea that he loved to go to church on Sabbath days. The man from Nazareth. This man from Nazareth was a disruptor. This man of Nazareth did not go through the ranks to become a speaker like their famous Pharisees or their conference speaker scribes or Sadducees. I like to call them the wouldn't sees and the couldn't sees. Jesus was in front of them. They were so blinded by religion and church they couldn't see God. Jesus, I think, woke up and he was like telling cussing Peter in the morning, hey, we're going to church today on the Sabbath. I think that was like, let's go make a mess of stuff. Let's go throw these people off. Let's go heal and make just a, a, a credible experience out of things today. I think it would have been really fun walking with Jesus. Can you imagine Mary Magdalene? You had John the crybaby. You have stealing Judas with him. You got computer nerd Andrew, come on, calculating everything. Thomas taking a Xanax every couple hours to keep himself from doubting. And you have all this humanity. How wild would it have been to walk with the man from Nazareth? What would it have been like when you knew you were on a mission and everywhere he went, something miraculous was going to happen? You didn't know if dead people were going to come alive. You didn't know if he was going to change weather patterns. You didn't know if he was going to go a trip to the graveyard and start calling demons out of people. You did not know if he was going to turn water into wine or if he was going to go WWF, come on, and break chairs, throw stuff. That man from Nazareth, he wasn't on TMZ. It wasn't there yet. He wasn't on TikTok. It wasn't there yet. But this man from Nazareth was a disruptor. And I love that he says he entered this synagogue or this church. So I did a little research. And the word entered means to come to interrupt or disrupt. How many of you know you can't change your future till you disrupt your present? You can't change your future till you disrupt your present. You can't change your health till you change your present habits. How many know that's true? You can't change the dynamic of your intimate relationships until you decide to do something different. Insanity is doing the same thing and wanting a different outcome. One way to say it is if you do what you've always done, you get what you always got. For things to become different, you got to become different. How many know it's easy to go to the same places, have the same conversations, say the same prayers? We're such, come on, we're such predictable people. Come on, we're creatures of habit. I like to always say, I'm sure God's ever wondered, like, hey, do you have any something different? Do you have any, like, new material for me when you're praying? You always pray the same prayers. Do you got anything different in your heart? Come on. Maybe some of you have been praying a lot of the same prayers for 13 years. Maybe it's time if you want to take that relationship with God to the next level, maybe pray a little bit of a different prayer. Maybe one of inspiration or one of desperation. But it's interesting that the word entered a situation, and when it did, Jesus didn't go and just sit in the back. He, woke, he walked right up as the word of God. Jesus is the word, and he took the stage, and he said, I'm going to begin to teach, which I love is he put an emphasis on putting God's word in your system. He still has an idea because you only grow to the knowledge of the truth you have in you. Scripture says the measure of thought and study you give to the truth you hear will be the measure of virtue and knowledge that comes back to you. That means if you want virtue and knowledge to come back to you, i got to put something in if I'm going to get something out. How many know I can't? Come on. Be careless or shallow and expect good results. It's amazing in life. We got dollar store, we got, we got you know, million dollar dreams, but we got dollar store investment in them. We think because we serve God, he's a genie and he's just going to pop it all out. I like what the Bible calls, it's actually, there's a gift called the working of miracles. It doesn't say God works the miracle, it says you work the miracle. Oh, what, we, what does that mean? There's a process from God that when I put something in and I work my land, I can have an abundance. But if I just hope and I don't work or put energy or effort into it, I end up with poverty. If you have a slack hand, you become po. P-O, po, come on. Slap the person next to you say, don't be po. What 
What's powerful about the word? Let me just give you a little background in case you're not familiar with it. Because I was once unfamiliar with it. But then on March 7th, and today's March 7th, but 1996 at 844 p.m. in Whittier, California, I had an encounter with Jesus. And this is my 26th year after an encounter to this date. It's my anniversary with him on 844 p.m. where he walked off the pages and he wasn't an idea like the Easter Bunny anymore. He was a living reality where that word became something to me. And it dropped from my head to my spirit. It produced conviction in me. When you have conviction, you got movement. It changes you. I don't want to know about God. I want to know God. I want to know his thoughts. I want to know his habits. I want to know his ways. Before I married him, I want to know what he's like. Some of you got married to people and you didn't know what they was like and Freddy Krueger jumped out and you're shocked. Come on, swipe right did not work. That was pretty good right there. The word shows up. The Bible says when the word shows up, the entrance of his word, it brings life. It brings light. It illuminates. It stops death. So a couple weeks ago, and I'm going to play this now, and then I'm going to carry it on. You'll see the rest of it. A couple weeks ago, I'm in a meeting. I was speaking to 1,800 people. And a couple hours before the meeting, I got a call from the police department. The psychologist of the police department, he's on my board, he called me and said, we had an emergency. A 13-year-old boy in Southern California, he dropped dead, 13 years of age. They tried to revive him, but he went eight minutes without any type of air inside of his lungs. And he went, and then all of a sudden, they tried to paddle him. He was still dead. They finally got a pulse. They put him in the ambulance, and he was, uh, he revived him twice, and he died twice. They got him there. And so I thought this would be an interesting way. Can we play the video real quickly, turn off the lights, and this is going to show you a little bit. That is a paramedic working on a lifeless boy, dead for eight minutes, 13 years of age, three weeks ago here in California. I want you to just get an image of that for a minute. Thank you very much for playing that. Turn on the lights. I was going to speak in a meeting, and he said, Rex, can you help? Can you step in and pray? Because I know when you pray, sometimes incredible things can happen. Isn't that interesting when you get known that you're no God? People come looking for you. In spite of your weaknesses, they know you, come on, you, you have a relationship. Even the unbelievers come looking for you. Come on. And he said, hey, listen. He said, they got him on a machine. There's no brave wave, brain waves, and there's no cardiac movement. He's on a machine that's breathing for him, and he has no brain waves whatsoever. And he says, can I come to where you're speaking, and would you pray on a video machine in the middle of your meeting, and I will take it back to the superintendent, and we'll see in the public school if they'll somehow allow us. And he says, you're going to have to pray for that too. The superintendent's an atheist. What an occasion for a God event. So he came in the middle, 1,600, 1,700 people. It was me and Bill Johnson. And it was a phenomenal meeting. Things were freaking rocking. And there was a lady they carried into the building when I was speaking. She had broke her back. She couldn't sit. She couldn't stand. And she took off running in front of everybody like it's going to happen tonight. People are going to get healed all over here. Not trick photography, not Christian TV, but God helping people. And at the end, and I said to the people, I said, turn on that video, and we're going to pray. And so as we began to pray, I started praying, I started commanding their cardiac cells of that young man to come back, a regeneration of neurological cells, brain cells to start regenerating. And all of a sudden, the word of God began to flow through my mouth. And I said to the mama, I said, mama, I said, the doctor that spoke to you came to a premature conclusion. It was the second doctor. Do not put faith in his words. The word of the Lord, the word of God is stepping into your situation, and he's disrupting this thing. Your son, Ben, his brain will regenerate. His cardiac cells will regenerate. I'm preserving his life for the purpose of his life, and I will bring him out. Don't buy into what they're telling you. And I left it at that. So watch how powerful. This gentleman takes back the video, and he takes it to the superintendent, who's an atheist, and he goes, I don't believe in God, but I feel something all over my body. 
He says we have to find a way to get that message and those words into the hands of that single mother in that office. Because how would he know, the superintendent said, that it was the second doctor who said he'll never regenerate in his mind. He's vegetable forever. It's permanent. And as a result, he said, we're going to go ahead and pull the plug on Friday morning. And we're going to harvest his organs and check what happened because of the negative effect of the vaccine. That's why he died. And dropped dead. And he said, what we're going to do is we're going to pull the plug at 10 a.m. on Friday. I had no idea of any of that. I just prayed and did the thing in front of all the people. They took that word back. And on Thursday morning, on Thursday morning, they gave that message and that word, come on, to that mama. And when that mama got that word, she went to the doctors and said these very things. She said, I got a word, I got a word, I got a word, I got a word, I got a word. We're not pulling the plug. They said, your, your son doesn't have brain waves. Your bra-, and she's like a Catholic woman. She doesn't have all the theology right. All she knew was she had a word from God that she received. When the word enters your situation or your atmosphere, things can become different. It can disrupt, come on, darkness to light, rejection and give you direction. It can lift shame and can restore your name. It can bring honor to your life. It can break addiction off your life. That word can open up doors that you don't see that are there. That word can resurrect hope. That word can bring health to your body and peace to your mind. Watch how powerful. That word, she goes, I want you, instead of doing that, before you can even even consider pulling him off that thing, she says, I want you to go back, and I want you to test his cell, his, test his heart. They said, ma'am, look right there. There's no heartbeat, and there's no brain operation. She says, I don't care what it looks like. I have a word. Don't let what you see talk you out of what God said. Even sugar looks like salt. Don't get it twisted. Your eyes can deceive you. Come on. Woo. This is from a woman I've never met before in my life. Watch how powerful this is. And I'm going to have you put up the picture in just a second. I was going to wait until the end, but I'm going to do it now because then I'm going to carry on my message. But what happened was so powerful. As they were doing the test, and as things were, did not show any function, as they started to do the test, all of a sudden there began to be a flicker in the brain. All of a sudden a neuron began to fire. Then a second neuron began to fire. Then a third neuron began to fire. And all of a sudden, part of the cardiac cells on the inner chamber of the heart began to flutter and move. And within a couple of hours, that young man came out on his own, and he started weeping and crying, came out of that machine, and he said, where's my mama? Where's my mama? I want to go home. I want to go home. I want to go home. Isn't it amazing that when the word of God comes into a situation that people have tried to revive, that you've tried to revive, that a counselor's tried to revive, that TikTok tried to revive, that Facebook tried to revive, that your friends tried to revive, and nothing can revive it but a word from God, a rhema word of God, a sword of the Spirit enters your life. All of a sudden, it begins to repel the very thing that was keeping that thing down. And all of a sudden, life comes into an area. Tonight, someone's going to get life back in an area. Tonight, someone's going to have regeneration of life. Because two days ago, just go and put his picture up there. That's little Ben that was dead, laying there on a gurney in front of everybody else. And Ben walked into the very place, alive, that which he died at. Some of you had dead relationships, dead marriages, dead in your spiritual walk, even though you're alive. And you're about to walk in alive again to the very place that you've looked dead in. Someone's about to emerge from their shell. Jesus entered. The word entered the situation. I'm getting hot in here. I'm going to take off my clothes. I think that was an Ellie song. The word entered. And he noticed there was a man whose right hand was withered. Why is that powerful? Because the right hand, according to the Bible, determines someone's ability to get blessing and to give blessing. It was in a withered state that caused him to hide, that caused him to be in shame. Because of that certain situation, he had to go and get a diagnosis from the religious and the medical community that he did not have to work and he could live off the handouts of the community because he had a weakness or disability. 
His lack of feeling and function determined how much he could try to reach for and grab and hold on to. How many know when areas of your life are withered, or one area could be withered in your life, it determines your expectation for other things in your life, what you reach for, what you hold on to? It's amazing he only had one area of his life that was withered, but it affected everything else. His issue became his identity. How many know that we never rise above the image that you carry of yourself? If you see yourself dull, unattractive, you act dull and unattractive. If you see yourself unlovable, when people offer love, you reject it because in your mind, you're not lovable. If you see yourself as something wrong with you and you internalize those labels, then all of a sudden, come on, people can offer opportunity to you. You can have all kinds of things happen, but you don't demand very much of yourself because you see yourself through the lens of something's wrong with me. And the enemy builds a case around you based on a condition. Every one of us in this room has got an issue or a condition no matter how we dress ourselves up. But the enemy works hard that that condition or that issue becomes your identity. Why? Because if you misdiagnose you, you mistreat you. And a man thinks or a woman thinks, so are they, so do they become. Your lid of your potential is the way that you currently think now. Most people don't think very much of themselves. And we were either taught, oh my goodness, that's prideful to think much of yourself. Well, that's interesting because the Bible says God's mind is full of me. Well, there's one thing about being full of yourself. It's another thing to think right about yourself. So this man was working this element of something's wrong with me. He's hiding in the back, hiding in the back of the church. And when Jesus walks in, immediately the word walks in. He goes after the one man that has been hiding. He goes after the one area in one man's life that has kept him sitting, kept him losing his voice, losing his ability to reach, because it's determined his expectation. How many know God doesn't meet you at the level of your need? He meets you at the level of your expectation. How many know when your expectations are low, what do you usually get? Low impact, low results. If you came in here tonight with not big expectations, you'd probably walk away, oh, that was good. I like that. It's just Okay. How's life? It's okay. How's relationships? They're okay. Come on. How's this? It's fine. How's that? It's fine. That four-letter F word, it's fine, will jack your life up more than any other F word. It doesn't hurt enough to do something about, and it's not great enough to shout about it, so therefore you live under the four-letter F word, everything is just fine. I don't know about you. I don't want to live a fine life. I don't want to live a domesticated, fine, tamed life. I feel like my mother would birth me and there was a shout in me when I came out of that womb. I don't want that shout to be reduced to a whisper. I want to have a shout in me in my 50s, a shout in me in my 60s, a shout in me as a creator, as a lover, as a giver. Life's supposed to be get brighter and brighter, not duller and duller. I love to talk to people in their senior years that got energy. They got more energy than these kids that are on their gadgets. Oh my gosh, I need another I need another Starbucks. Come on, why you're like 12? Why do you need so much coffee? I feel so blah. Come on. Then you meet like an 86-year-old person that's got energy and full of gratefulness and happiness. You're like, "Can you put some of that in them?" The Bible says you'll be flourishing Psalm 92 in your old age. Not weak and beat up, toe up, come on. Impactful, purposeful. I love this for a minute because most people's expectations reduce them to where they don't engage with life. They feel like I'm either entitled or, you know what, I'm just going to sit here and if anything good comes my way, that's really cool, it'll happen for me. But I found something in life. Jesus did it the same way with this man. He did not come to comfort the man. He came to challenge that man. What if in this world right now, many people in this America right now are waiting for some political savior to come along? Oh, if Donald Trump gets in there, he's going to change it all. He's not the savior? Well, if Joe Biden gets another term, please, man, the guy can't ride his bicycle. He's going to fall over. He don't got a health care plan for his own self. How are you going to have one for you? I'm just reporting the news. It ain't rocket science. 
That's a special kind of stupid. I don't know about you, but if we're the church, if we really belong to him, the king, and he's a name above every name, and he's wisdom, he loves everybody, he has good works for everybody, I don't want to play that game. I want my expectation to be extremely high that there's a responsibility for me not to wait for life to happen, but there's an engagement level because of my expectation that I should be the change in this world. Well, I'm just waiting for the Lord to bless Douglas, Georgia. The only blessing he's going to do is through your hands and through your mouth. If, if, if Georgia does not prosper, it ain't God's fault. It's our fault. If Douglas does not succeed, if our kids don't succeed, it's not on God. It's on us. Because God said our kids will be mighty in the land, not weak in the land. They're miracles. How many with me on this kind of an idea? So Jesus confronts this guy and he goes, yo, man, I want you to stand up. I want you to stand up. And the man had a decision to make. How many know it's your decisions, not conditions, that determine how life plays out? Hopefully tonight you get provoked enough, you go, i got to make a new decision in my life. I want to make a new decision to change my relationship dynamics. I, wanna, I don't want my relationship to be about conflict. I want it to be about creation. It's not who you're in a relationship with, but how you show up in the relationship that counts. How many know love begins with you? I want to make a new relationship. I want, to, I want to make a new decision about my health. I want to make a new decision to take on a skill. I want to make a new decision about to use my faith in a greater way. I want to make a new decision to step out in spiritual gift, God's love language for the humanity, and use spiritual gifts to liberate people. And the man stood up. A couple weeks back in early January, I was at, speaking for Matt, and he had all these kids, all these young people. Matt does this in Tennessee. He goes, yo, can you fly in for the night? And I did. And I'm sitting there, and I was praying beforehand. And I felt the Lord say, I'm going to send you somebody that has problems in their hands. I'm like, God, that doesn't seem like a really good word of knowledge. I wanted someone's name. Because not too long ago, I had 7,000 people in a tent, and God gave me a really cool name. I go, there's someone here by the name of Carrera. True story. It's on film. Carrera. You've had da 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 da. It was like you couldn't. It wasn't like just Jim Smith. Come on, somebody. It was either sink or swim, either hit or you missed. <laughs> Flipping Carrera was in the very back, and it was like it looked really good. Someone's hands. Just telling you the truth. Someone's hands. Okay, I'm at a young people thing, and in the middle of my message, I go, "There's somebody here who's got problems in your hand." And this girl stood up, 18 years old, shy, and she had hid her hands in her jacket because she was embarrassed. I go, Why, what's the matter? You could tell she was timid. She was nervous. She goes, a couple years ago in my dad's auto body shop, he had steel outside, and it was in the hot sun, and I did not know that. And I went to help, and I put my hands on the thing to help him, and I seared both of my arms and my hands to where now there's no nerve, there's no feeling in both my arms to my elbows all the way through my hands and my fingers. I can't feel a pencil, I can't feel a Slurpee, can't feel Starbucks, I can't feel a fork when I eat. Here's a young girl, and she could tell she was embarrassed. And she goes, all I knew was when there was an opportunity, God is here, I had to take a stand. How many know if you don't make a stand when God gives an opportunity, you go back to the where things were, come on. Or you regress, retain, and you retard, you damn up. This girl decided to stand up. She goes, I'm nervous and I'm shaking. I'm nervous and I'm shaking. And then all of a sudden, I prayed for her, and she starts weeping uncontrollably. True? Sobbing uncontrollably. She goes, I can't feel, but I can feel. I can't, he I can't, I can't do this, but I, I'm feeling. I'm feeling this in my, I can feel my arms. I can feel my hands. I can feel my arms. And she starts weeping, and this guy next to her stands up. And he goes, because she stood up, I want to stand up. He goes, he goes, I'm not supposed to do this probably, but I'm a bad man. It's a pretty gutsy thing to say in front of people. He goes, I'm a bad man and I do bad things to people. But I have bad, bad things done to me. He goes, can that same power take the badness out of my heart? I don't want to be a bad man anymore. He goes, she gave me courage that when she stood in her pain and did not want to be in the shadows anymore of her shame, I wanted to stand up too. And I said, is there anybody else in this room that you have issues in your heart that you're tired of sitting on and you're tired of just being comfortable in? But tonight's an opportunity for you to stand and raise your stand. 
standard of what you're going to tolerate and let God heal you in your life. 82 people lifted up their hands in that room that night. They stood up in that room, and one after the other for the next two hours, we began to pray for people one after the other. So many healings and freedom, all because one woman decided to take a stand. How many know life changes when you raise your standard and you take a stand? There's different levels of life. To go to a new level, you get what you tolerate. If you can tolerate depression, I'll prophesy to you, you'll get more of it. If you can tolerate as diabetes is your destiny, you got it. According to your faith, let it be unto you. If you can tolerate living in debt, having a loveless marriage, being passive and watching other people have a great life but you not have a great life and you give all your bs's all your belief system excuses well they're better than me i'll probably never recover i've been through too much i've gone through this how many of us all have a reason to have an excuse how many of us need to divorce a story that keeps us sitting in the back voiceless come on visionless, powerless, that we sit through over and over and we sit on our blessed assurance and we're waiting for God to do it and then he brings a moment and he says, what, I want you to stand. Somebody needs to stand for something. Maybe you need to stand for, you know what, I'm going to be the one in my family that breaks things. Hezekiah stood, his dad was one of the most wicked kings in the world. Hezekiah said he watched his dad close all the churches. And when they did, there was violence rampant. When there was a fight against the church, everybody was violently rampant. And they went into great poverty, and they lost seven battles in a row. Sounds like what we're currently in in America. But when Hezekiah got in power, the first thing he did is, I'm not going to do what my dad did. First thing he did was, I'm not going to fix the roads. I'm not going to fix the economy. The first thing I'm doing, I'm opening up all the churches, baby. Why? Because if there's any revival in the land, it's got to be spiritual and not natural. If there's going to be any change in the world, it's got to be spiritual. That's why we can't look at political figures. If you're a political figure, go in there and dominate. Come on. Give integrity and righteousness. But I don't know about you. It's got to be spiritual or it won't last. Come on. you got to have a spiritual resurrection in your family. Well, praise the Lord. We'll just wait and see. I don't know about you. I take a stand. Something happened when I stood in, in 1996, and the guy goes, who's going to stand for God for once in their life? And I stood at 8, 8.44, I took a stand and it, it broke my past. I divorced an old story of foolish, disobedient, dead in sin, dead in sickness, impoverished, grossed in all kinds of messes. But I divorced an old story when I took a stand. What do you need to stand for? What do you need to stand against? Who do you need to stand with? Who do you need to stand with? Sometimes going to church, you can become so accustomed to going to church, but maybe you just stand with somebody to stir up love and good works. When people walk in that door, you should look at, man, I'm here to bless people. I'm here to encourage people. I'm here to lift people, enlighten people, and live. I'm going to stand with somebody. Watch. He said, I want you to stand. Now I want you to step, come up here. I want you to reposition yourself. A couple years ago during the pandemic stuff, I remember we had this bird nest outside, a bird decided to lay its nest, and my little girl, she ran and she goes, Dad, she goes, the pool, the, the bird, the mama bird took the baby bird out of the pool, or out of the nest, and it fell in the pool, and it's dying in the pool, it's not moving. Dad, go get it, go get it. Sure. Come on, anybody dads in there? Come on, guys, sure. A little bird, whatever. So I remember going in, getting the bird out of the pool, it looked dead. And I got a spoon because I like cleanliness. Come on, somebody. I don't got enough country in me yet. You got to help me, Pope. Come on, somebody. I need Jerry to take me out on the golf cart and do some shooting or something. I got a big old spoon. My wife's like, what are you doing? I go, I got to save the bird for Kira. I got to save the bird for Kira. It looks dead. She goes, no, you just need to reposition it back in the nest. I go, the the mom bailed on it. Because he thought the bird was dead. She goes, Rex, you got to reposition it so you can teach it to fly. I'm not like an animal scientist. I don't help birds fly. I help humans fly. That's not my gift. Come on, I'm out there in your shorts, your Lululemon shirt. Feeling totally unprepared for the moment. It's like I got a spatula. It looks like I want to eat the bird, not help the bird. 
So I put the bird, I got it out, and Kira's like, come on, Dad, you got to save it. Reposition it back under the nest so maybe it can grow a little bit more. But then I, I put it in there, and it kept falling out. She goes, Dad, you're killing it. I'm going, I'm trying my best. Come on, anybody out there, you're trying your best for your kids? Come on, you're like, oh, this is not working good. I hope the animal planet is nowhere near me. This is not good for PETA. I picked that thing up and it dropped maybe about six or seven times. They go, okay, but now Rex, you got it in there. Now you got to teach it to fly. What do you mean teach it to fly? Am I going to sit down there and go like this? It's a bird. It's a baby bird. Baby little dove. So it would fall down. It would fall down. I would take it out and put it on the ledge. And then they would do it. It would fall down. And then it started to move one of its little wings. And it would move a little bit more. And it would fall down. I kept putting it back up there. And then it started flying a little bit to a little, little like a couple little feet. Then it would fly back to the nest. I sat there and taught that thing how to fly. It was never going to learn to fly. And if it did not, come on, return to its nest or get repositioned out of an environment that would not let it succeed and grow and thrive. How many know you'll never find your wings if you're in an environment that doesn't allow you to fly and soar? Oh, this is going to be good for a minute. Scripture says in Deuteronomy 32, that 32, that God just comes down and he stirs the nest. Ooh, when a mother eagle creates a nest, she creates it with cushion and padding. She puts all these nice comforts inside of there. And for three and a half months, that eagle sits in there under the warm embrace. The mama and dad bring it food morning and evening. I left to the eagle's own devices. The eagle will never leave its nest. It's comfortable. It's born not flying, but with the potential to fly. But the mother comes at a certain season and will begin to do something. All the different things that were protective of that eagle and cushion. Now that mother eagle shoves those sticks back in so it pokes the very eagle that she loves the most. She does it not to hurt the eagle, but to disrupt the comfort of the eagle so it doesn't arrange its future based on its present comfort. How many of you feel for the last little bit there's been some irritation in your life? Anybody felt that besides me? Could it be it's not the devil but it's God messing with you? Oh, you really believe that? Yeah, I ain't teasing either. God don't give disease to nobody. He don't bring destruction to nobody. But sometimes God will become, let you feel a supernatural irritation in your spirit because he's trying to help you find that there's more in you than the nest can contain. See, some of you have outgrown your nest, and if you're not careful, you will die in your nest. And he loves you too much to leave you in your nest spiritually, emotionally, financially, and he's come to stir the nest. Someone to say to you next, you say, he's stirring your nest. Come on, give me seven minutes and I'm going to pray. Someone say, he's stirring your nest. That's why you can go to places you used to go comfortable to and now you don't feel comfortable there. You can be in conversations and you feel conviction about talking about people. All of a sudden you feel conviction about going to certain things or watch. All of a sudden you feel a conviction you didn't feel before. Why? Because the, uh, the father, the, the eagle, the master eagles after what he put into his young. The unused success that's lying dormant. Because an eagle has the ability to see five times the size of a, a human with accuracy two miles ahead. There are wings on each side, nine feet on each side. But they don't discover their wings until the e mother eagle begins to stir the nest. Now they go and they perch on the edge of the, edge of the nest, and when they're out on the edge of the nest, now they got to begin to lose their wings and begin to flutter and find their wings and learn how to use the wind. Could it be that God's repositioning you in your life and letting you feel a little discomfort so you can find your wings for this next season and learn how to use the winds? Oh, this is good. How many feeling me up in here for a minute? You feel me in here? Watch out, this is going to be a good blockbuster ending too, it's going to be good. Watch. The mother eagle goes out there and he teaches her young to start flapping their wings. It's awkward at first because they've not had to use them before. But some of you, come on, God's stirring up gifting inside you. You've never used the word of knowledge. You've never had to forgive at a high level. You've never had to pray for someone that's sick before. You've never had to live in freedom outside of addiction before. You've never had to do something you've never done. But if you're going to get what God asked or what you've asked God for, he's not going to let you stay the same person. 
The dream comes in a size too big that you grow into it. Nobody wants growing pain. Come on, ask any woman in here that's give birth to a child. Did you enjoy the birthing process? And if any man's next to her and you decide to have an audacity to say, oh, my wife did, come on, you're going to get slapped. Come on, when there's pushing and huffing and puffing, come on, and breathing, things are sweaty, come on, that wasn't like the conception mode. This is the birthing mode. See, some of you have been pregnant for so long, and God doesn't want you to have a still birth, and he's come to disrupt your spirit of your womb because there's about to be a shift in your life where you're going to step in and find and give birth to what God put inside you. Oh, but it's uncomfortable. It's supposed to be. I want comfort. Oh, faith means comfort. BS. It's a belief system. Faith makes things possible, not easy. Faith wasn't supposed to be easy. In the world, you got stuff going on. This is where the faith message gets jacked up. This is where charismatic stuff gets jacked up. We need faith to push through. We need faith to push out a business. We need faith to develop a relationship. We need faith to raise kids in a tough time. We need faith, come on, to use gifts if you're a nurse and do things that would be on the normal. Oh, my gosh. But you're asking me to step towards you. This man had to walk in front of everybody. Uncomfortable. Jesus didn't say to run. He said to walk. No one likes walking. When he says the steps of a good man or woman are ordered by the Lord, what does that mean besides spiritual knowledge? That means the steps that you take, he can order. But he can't order what you don't step into. If there's not new steps, why you bother to him for not ordering them? And if he wants to lead you in victory and triumph into abundance and you ain't getting it, it's because we ain't stepping. Well, I just want you to pray. I fall down and get it. That's not the way it works. There could be impartation, incubation, but now there's got to be a manifestation. Manifestation don't come by someone praying for me. It comes by me acting out. That's why every miracle Jesus puts somebody into an active state. Watch how powerful this is. Watch how powerful this is. He says, stand here. The man had the courage not just to stand, but start to step towards something. What's the vision? What's the word? What's the calling that's calling you to step toward? I got to forgive somebody. I got to forgive myself. What's the calling? I got to build this thing. I got to go get educated in this thing. I got to go get skilled in this thing. I got to go birth this ministry. I got to care for the poor. I want to reach out to kids that don't have that don't have parents. I could become a foster parent as they were helping somebody earlier. Uh, what's the call that's calling you? I don't know about you. I'm only going to be judged in heaven by did I live out my calling. Someone say, I got a calling. Come on. The Bible's ask me and you. I just say it with passion because I feel that in my heart. Not just in front of you. I'm asking this in my own self. I got to live a life worthy. That means I got to step up. I got to step up to the, to the calling that's over your life. I can't just sit down. I got to step up. That's hard. It's uncomfortable. Noah, build a boat. You haven't seen rain. Go get all the squirrels. Go put them into a boat. Go get the foxes, the chimpanzees. That wasn't easy. Come on. Go challenge a bunch of people and fight them. David goes, I'll do it. Everybody else bows out. You read about David because he had courage to conquer something. Ooh, wait a second. He says, I want you to come here. The man walked toward his calling. Bartimaeus was blind when God called him. He couldn't see. You would say, that'd be insensitive, Jesus. Don't you know we're in woke culture right now? (laughs) Have you not heard what Kamala Harris said? We're woke culture. Oh, my gosh. That's so insensitive, Jesus. You would tell a blind man to walk to you? You go to him, miracle worker. I'm going to amen myself. You ought to be freaking shouting by now. (laughs) Jesus told a blind man to walk. Blind potential walking. And Jesus didn't do nothing until he saw him walking. Wow, I wonder when this guy walked, Jesus then went to go meet him. God prepares a table before you in the presence of your enemies, but he's waiting for you to walk toward him. I don't know, what are you, are you standing for one, and then what are you stepping toward? 
I don't know about you. I'm stepping into a new realm of abundance. I'm stepping into a new realm of God's power on my life, God's wisdom on my life. I'm stepping into a new realm of generosity. I don't know what you're stepping into. Someone says, I'm stepping in. Someone say, I'm stepping in. Slap the person next to you. I'm stepping in. Got two minutes. Here we go. Watch. Then he goes, then he goes, okay, you got here. But now here's the command. I want you to stretch. Oh, Jesus, you didn't, you're not going to just wave the wand, put the oil on my eyes, spit in my eyes? Come on, Matt, you feel me? You're not just going to spit on my tongue? Jesus, you're not just going to throw mud on my face? You want me to stretch? Do you not realize I have no feeling and I have no function? Oh, isn't it interesting that the word did not consult his feeling? Has God ever come to you and say, oh my gosh, this is what I'm thinking of doing, but how are you feeling about it? How are you feeling about walking in forgiveness? Rex, oh my gosh, how are you feeling about walking out of miracle? Oh my gosh, Rex, what do you feel about raising the dead? How do you feel about going in there when the person's on a machine? Well, it's easy to pray in here and go, God, touch them. Yeah, go in there where they're dead on a machine. Go see the difference. Yeah, I ain't talking about something I ain't living. I'm talking because I'm still working it out and walking it out. Come on, I ain't arrived yet. Come on, but I see more of it now than I did because I keep walking in it. You Come on, keep stepping in it. What if it doesn't work? What if it does? But it could go so wrong, but it could go so right. And the more you know the habits of your father, you realize it's going to end well if you don't quit walking toward it. Stretched. I can't feel. I don't feel like it. I don't feel like I could get the money. I don't feel like I'm enough. I don't feel like I'll ever be loved. God says I got a somebody special for it. But I don't feel like it. I've been through so much addiction. I've been through so much stuff. I had an abortion. I did a rape. I did this. I did all these. Things. But God says I got this for you. But you don't understand. God gives the invitation. You give limitation. What's the thought that's draining your power? That keeps you from stepping out. Is that I'm not? Because every one of us right now, there's another level that God's asking every one of us to stretch into. No one wants to stretch. Go look at pro athletes. No one wants to stretch. I just did the. I just did a, a, a team the other day, a basketball team, a pro team, uh, or a college team. Excuse me. And, and I was doing the whole team. They weren't excited about stretching. They just want to get out there and play. And God says, stretch, stretch. Can you imagine? I can't feel. Come on, some of you feel a little awkward and you have to stretch. Maybe God's asking you to stretch in your gift. There's a woman, Alice, in World War II by Hitler. They put her in not an Auschwitz but another camp. And she was a classic pianist. And they only kept her son alive. They said, you will give concerts four times a week or else we'll kill your son. They'd already killed her whole family. She was at the point where she was going to let them kill her family, her, her, but she goes, my son, I don't want him to die. I want him to have a chance at life. So they said, will you go ahead and we need you to go ahead and give a concert. She did it reluctantly, but she said, I had to unhook my gift and start using my gift even where I was. She wrote a book, The Garden of Eden in the Middle of Hell. Phenomenal book. And she started playing concerts in the middle where people were dying, emaciated, destroyed by Hitler. Hitler would use pictures of her to say, see, we're not treating people bad. And she would use her gift reluctantly, but she said, my gift, I believe, would make room for me because she was a Jew. And she'd heard Solomon say that in the back yeah. of the scriptures. How many know if you work your gift and unhook it, God can make room for you? Jesus, through a prophetic word, told the man, go get a kid, go get a donkey, go get an ass. It's all locked up over there. No one's ever ridden on it. I want to ride into an old Jerusalem on a new donkey. I need you to unlock that gift because I want to ride in on it and come into a new place. What if God wants to ride on your gift, but it's all locked up in an old thing? Any conditions? I need it so good for me because I'm addicted to comfort. I don't worship Jesus. I worship my comfort, but I love to worship songs. When you come in here, what do you worship, your feelings or God? When you come here and I'm standing here, am I lifting my hands to my feeling? Am I worship the God of my feelings? 
Am I worshiping my comfort? Or am I worshiping my creator? Am I worshiping my healer? Am I worshiping my liberator? Am I worshiping my savior? Or am I worshiping my feelings? As long as I feel I'm good. You're not what you feel, you're what you decide. She began to play concerts, and what happened, not only did her son survive, but people in the infirmary, they were not too many hundreds of yards away, could hear her playing. And people that were dying, go read her autobiography. They said that when she began to use her gift in the middle of hell on earth, they said their bodies were lifted up out of their pain and their torment, and as long as she was playing for those moments, they felt freedom from all the negative experiences. I wonder when you use the gift that God's given to you, that you discovered it, that all of a sudden not only does it survive you and make room for you, but it brings you before great people that heals other people. What about the relationships in you? What it's like to be in a relationship with you? What do people get when they get you? Is it fun? Is it exciting? Or is it boring? It's only boring if you're boring. Come on, slap the person next to you. Say, please don't be boring no more. You're at the love conference. Quit being boring. Come on. Stop being boring to God. Stop being boring to yourself. Stop being boring to your spouse and your kids. Some of you ought to just spice it up. Do cartwheels in your kitchen. Come on. Some of you ought to go home and make love if you're married. Come on, somebody. There was a one shout of triumph in that. What the heck is wrong with y'all? Come on. Come on, if you're in a relationship with yourself, go through your house and jump up and down and say, I'm single but enjoying my life. You really live that way? Yeah, the Bible says shout with a voice to triumph. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. You really talk that way about all the other stuff too? Yeah, the Bible says let your fountain be blessed. Let it be a running fountain, not a stagnant fountain. Some of you got a stagnant relationship because your fountain ain't moving. Stir it up. Oh, Rex, is this going into sex ed? No. Stretch spiritually. Stretch spiritually. Stretch spiritually. God, uh, for the next seven days, I'm just going to give thanksgiving all day long. I'm not asking you for anything. I'm praising you and thanking you. Thank you for how far you brought me. Thank you for the change you broke off me. Thank you for the healing you did in my body and my mind. Thank you for what you brought me out of when I thought I was going to lose my dang mind. Thank you for bringing me out of the divorce. Thank you for bringing me through the diagnosis. Thank you, God. For giving me breath in my lungs. I might not be what I wanted. Thank you, God, that I'm still somebody in your eyes. But then someone's going to tap into not just intimacy. They're going to stretch in your authority. Why? Because when you become aggressive spiritually, not in an oppressed state, but an aggressive state, the atmosphere of your life gets radical. You want a different atmosphere, a different mood, a different state? Get radically spiritually. Get radically, spiritually. When I was in front of Mark Zuckerberg's whole team, and I'm sitting there, and the atmosphere was dark and ugly and full of all kinds of you-know-what. They just had a hypnotist right before me. My kind of atmosphere. (laughs) See, some of you, oh, my gosh, they're going to get you. Oh, my gosh, the psychics are going to get you. Do you not know who you is? Timbaland wrote a song a while ago, The Way I Are. You ought to understand the way I are. Do you know when I look into the mirror of God's word, I don't see a natural Rex. I see a king through the blood of Jesus that I got authority to make stuff happen on this planet. This isn't a religious game to me. There's demons out there. I want to push stuff back. Some of you, come on, wake up in the middle of the night with too many covers and you start fighting. Come on, bed, bath, and beyond. Calvin Klein sheets, come on. Some of you, come on, you went to the belk, you got to go get new sheets at the belk. Because why? You got in a fight in the middle of the night. You had a bad dream and you got suffocated. Why don't you do that spiritually? Why are you a punching bag for the enemy? Just letting him put whatever thought he wants to in your mind. Your mind makes the heaven out of hell a hell out of heaven. I don't know about you. I want to say, no, 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 devil, uh uh-uh. I got authority over you. Get off my mind. Get off my children. Get off my body. Get off my health. Get off my money. Get off my future. No, no, you ain't coming here. I break your power off my family. He knows me. He knows me. He knows who you are, too. The problem is if you don't back off, it's because you don't talk to him. You pray about him, but don't talk to him. 
The Bible does not say you're to fight the devil. It says to cast him out. Nowhere in the Bible does it say to fight the devil. If you're fighting the devil, you're fighting the wrong battle. He'll wear you out. Daniel 7 will be fulfilled in you. He wears out the saints because they fight the wrong battle. They fought the devil. You have authority to cast him out. And I'll end with this thing. I'll end with this. Two weeks ago in this meeting, I was in another meeting a couple days after the one with this boy. And then there was a, a woman. I saw crutches in the back. And I ended up the whole meeting. There was about 2,000 people in the room. I walked to the woman with crutches. I go, what's up? What happened to you? She goes, I was in a skiing accident. She and her husband was with her. She goes, my knee, it was all bent in. She goes, I can't put any weight on my, on my leg. She says, it's a mess. And she goes, I got to have surgery on it. I jacked it up real bad. I can't put any weight or anything on it. I go, do you think that God could take us to places that we couldn't go on our own tonight? You think God could help someone? She goes, you're inspirational and I like your energy. That's a good compliment. I hope they say the same about you when you go to Ruby 2B Tuesdays in Chick-fil-A. Come on. I hope they go, yeah, Jared, when he walks in, that guy's got energy. When Shannon walks in, come on. When Tamika walks in, I hope that they go, oh, yeah, they're, they're, they're cool. They got energy. She goes, I'm willing to be open. Oh, my gosh, I feel centered. Let's try. I feel it one, the law of attraction. Joking. I don't believe in the law of attraction. I believe in the law of action. You reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. I sow miracles. I reap miracles. I sow miracles. I reap miracles. That's going to happen in here tonight. Not just miracles for people's health, people's minds, people's money. Your, come on, your oil's going to go further than what it does. Your bills are going to, come on, are not going to shrink in size because God's going to make things go further than what they're going to go. There's going to be creative miracles that are going to be released over your household tonight. I'm not, I'm not, that's what I'm here to do. I'm here to impart. Paul said, I long to impart a spiritual gift to you. Romans 1.11, I'm here to impart something. You're not just preach a good little message. Watch how powerful. The woman goes, I can't do it. I go, what if you could try and just hold on to my shoulder? We could hop for a couple steps. She needed a little bit of help just to get her going. That's why you're in a great vehicle in this covenant church to help you get going. Maybe for some of you it's baby steps. She took a couple baby steps. Then she goes, I can't do this. I can't do this. And her husband's like, babe, look at what you're doing. He goes, I can't do this. And all of a sudden, she started running across the whole entire church. She had, their, she had herself, she ran all across the church. All of a sudden, they started running up and down every aisle. A woman that was paralyzed in her face, 59 years of age, and deaf in her ears. Go watch the video online. In a moment, because one woman got liberated by the grace of Christ, by the goodness of Jesus, and he's not changed from then to now. That one woman, her whole facial paralysis left, her deaf ear open with nobody praying for her, then two different crippled people on that platform, and a young guy with a cool afro that was blind since birth, 16 years of age, first time in church. In one moment, his blind eye popped open. He goes, this is real stuff. He goes, I can see. I can see. I've not been able to see ever since birth. He goes, what is this? How many know nothing changes until you use spiritual authority? Some of you are going to rise up and go, me and my family, we're going to serve God. It don't look good right now. My kids are going to come home. It don't look good right now in my marriage, but I take authority here. Love's going to win here, not selfishness. Mercy's going to win here, not misery's going to win here. Some of you might have to step through some misery and some mundane to get the miraculous, but it's worth standing, stepping, come on, and stretching. Someone say, I'm going to stretch. Someone say, I'm going to stretch. Come on, say, I'm going to stretch. Ryan, can you help me and play a little bit behind me? Give me some Stevie Wonder or something. Doesn't it have to be all apropos? No. In Suge Knight's house one night, I, I went for it. The head of Death Row Records. The sick got healed there. They got healed at Eddie Murphy's house. They got healed. Why do you say those names? So he gives you context. They got healed at the White House when I was there, and I didn't care for the president. Why? Because God's good to people. He's good to people I like and people I don't like. He loves people I love and loves people that I don't care for. Come on, he wants to bless the people that you don't like the most. Come on, he wants to reverse darkness off of every human because he's merciful. Aren't you glad that God's merciful? He don't treat us like we deserve. We're so glad you joined us today. The Word of God always works. The Bible says God watches over His Word to perform it. So as you're listening to the Word of God, He works His Word to help you. 
His word works and helps you out of your situations, out of your troubles. But if you listen to what he has to say to you, he loves you so much. God came into the world through Jesus Christ, his son, to save sinners. So today, if you have a hurt in your heart, if you need God, he's here to help you, to save you. So if you would today, pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, come into my life. I give you my heart. I want you to take over my life. I need you and I ask you to live in me. I'm giving you my heart and I'm receiving you in Jesus' name, amen.